Hey everyone, Hurricane Liz here, and we're back again for another Professor's Podcast. And with me, as always, is my partner in crime, Mr. Howard Ty, who I always call the man, the myth, the legend, or to me, it's just Howie. So Howie, today we've got a really special guest. I'm super hyped up for this one. I even went, I took a shower, and then I came over here. I was a little bit out of breath because I walked a whole 10 feet. And that's kind of like the usual routine right now for me during the pandemic. And obviously, I'm just kidding. But I will say that I am stoked for this interview more than any of the other interviews. And I'll tell you guys the reasons for it in just a minute. But Howie, how excited are you today for the gentleman that we're about to interview that has agreed to speak and to come out almost of the true underground and actually reveal himself before all the people that are actually going to participate in this event. How excited are you? Very excited. It's kind of hard to have like a really big seller to come on like live on like, uh, you know, like a virtual kind of mastermind because a lot of these big sellers are really want to keep it very low profile. They don't really want people to know what they do in order to get that sales amount. You know, this, this guy right here uh, is Travis is one of my clients and he's doing about 50 million dollars in sales so it was really hard for me to get him on here but i did i kind of had to like uh push him a little bit to get on our show so right and i know you wrangled him up you kind of pretty much almost pretty much begged him howie to get on this show because of the fact that like i said you can tell there's something special about this guy he actually had the favorite answer to something that i said at the mastermind but I can't reveal what happened behind closed doors, so I won't say what that answer to that was. But I will say this. He basically dropped knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb at that event in Mexico. I was rather impressed, and I know that you were too, Howie. That's why you very much did all that you could to get him on here today. So what do you say? You ready to start tag teaming this guy? And again, I know there's all those dirty bastards out there. I'm talking about tag teaming, like asking them questions back and forth. Keep your minds out of the gutter, people, or maybe not. But Howie, you ready to go? Yes, let's do it. Awesome. So without further ado, let me introduce you guys to the $50 million man, Travis Killian. And Travis is in the good old state of Texas with Travis. I don't know if I shared this with you. From I'm actually from Texas. Um, as you know, everything's bigger in Texas. Oh, yeah. So we'll talk more about that in private. But I will say this much. You're in a fun town. Austin is one of my favorite cities in Texas. And so I know there's a lot of exciting things to do there on your off time. But you've been at home and you're kind of also getting possibly the cabin fever that most of us have been feeling. And I know that you agreed. And out of the kindness of your heart, because you do a lot with Howard, you agreed to speak at this event. So I know that there's really nothing convincing that you have to tell Howard that he doesn't already know about you. But if you had to sort of give everybody out there listening a quick two minute elevator pitch of who you are and what you've done, let us know a little bit more about the $50 million man other than, hey, you're just Travis from Austin. <laughs> All right. So yeah, my name is Travis. I, I tend to go by Travis Killing It. My last name is Killian. And uh, so I, I, yeah, I just started selling on Amazon like I don't know, January 2016. And it's not my first rodeo in e-commerce. Kind of hit the ground running. It took no investors and was able to scale from zero to 50 million a year. And what are we at? Like uh, four and a half years. And to do that, like requires, obviously like you got to have like a, a lot of confidence in what you do. You got to have uh, money behind what you're doing and you got to be willing to reinvest everything. Like, it's funny. I, I tell my friends all the time. I'm like, like, dude, like, I know I make all this money, but I don't have a lot because <laughs> it just goes all back in the business. I mean, you can't grow like triple digits a year. And that's sort of the, I don't see enough sellers talking about that. And I guess one of my biggest assets and biggest strengths and why I was able to have a lot of success with this venture is because I come from a Google SEO background. I had an SEO agency in college and I was ranked like uh, number one for SEO in my city. I had a lot of clients and I built a lead generation company outside of college, a seven figure lead gen company while I'm a senior in college. And I quickly realized that um, my math degree wasn't really going to get me very far, but that's okay. I still finished anyway. Uh, but I think that gave me a lot of, a huge advantage because going through Google, right? Like, like a, a big difference between Google and Amazon is you're working against like the uh, against the tide with Google, right? Like they, they don't make money from organic search results. Amazon does. So I've I've been through the biggest algorithm updates in Google the historically. And so I knew like when you find something that works, when you have like, when, when you're having success, like we did with Amazon, well, our first two products, my partner and I, uh, when you have something that works, like you, you have a, a, a window of opportunity, it's not going to work forever. 
And I knew that. I was conditioned from that. I was like, if I, I always told myself, if I were to go back to Google back in 2009, like I would have just scaled like crazy as fast as I could, made as much money as possible because I knew that because it, it's going to change. You know, we tend to get caught up in our success and think that the way that we're doing things now is going to keep us, you know, it, it's going to be uh, repeated like over and over again, right? Like we don't tend to, I always look at things as like a six, we have a six to 12 month opportunity and then it's going to change and you just got to be ready for that. And I think that's uh, being able to solve problems, being able to identify trends, study competitors, constantly running experiments. I think it's given me a, a huge edge. And, and then just honestly, just operating by my favorite motto, which is if you're not scaling, you're failing. And uh, <laughs> I think that's what kind of has gotten here. Yeah, well, you just answered my last, my next question. But regarding, I always tell everyone, like, you got to watch out for these people who know a lot of the internet marketing, SEO, Google SEO people, you know, those guys are like killer. Those, those guys that know this stuff in Amazon, it's like so much easier because Amazon mm-hmm. doesn't change as much. Amazon changed like, uh, like step by step and not as fast as Google. And um, in Google, you could be like number rank number one in one day and the next day, the penguin comes out or some shark comes out yeah. and, and then you yeah. get, you get like deranked and you get sandboxed and everything, you know? So there's a lot of like, it's, it's kind of like, you got to like milk it kind of for Google, but for mm-hmm. Amazon, it's more stable and more, more of a, like a, you know, like a stoke growth. Do you agree where like, if, if these internet marketers, these affiliates come into the space, it's going to be hard for these normal sellers to survive. Uh, yes and no. Right. So, the difference between an affiliate mindset and like a, say an Amazon e-commerce mindset is affiliate mindsets are always chasing something. They're chasing that short-term cash flow. And Amazon, Amazon or e-commerce in general is way more of a complete business model. You have to be willing to like go all in and reinvest profits. You have to have really good cash flow. You got to have like cash management. You got to have logistic strategy. Like you can do really well for a couple of products. And I think we see that, right? Like we see guys that come in and kill it with a handful of products. And then there's something that holds them back from going from five to 20, 30, 40, 50 products. And that really is because like you quickly realize that all right, it's, uh, you, you can do this, but can you really like, do you really have the, the, like the motivation or the willpower to like, to, to give it everything you're worth, uh, to give it everything, to hire like a big team, to develop SOPs, to adapt to like, to, you know, uh, to take your personal like opinions about like how to do something and, and override it with facts. Do you have your ability to do that? And also do you honestly, like what motivates you whenever you are, 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 are having success? A lot of people, they have a couple of good products and they're making a couple million a year and they're like, nah, I don't really want to keep going. Like I'm just going to chill and make a lot and just travel the world and automate my business. Uh, I have a funny story. One of my top competitors and one of my, in my, one of my first personages that I did, he it was just us two for like two years like you know he had a huge advantage with the reviews and rankings and we were just right there neck and neck and then all of a sudden like we overtook him and then never looked back like and we just created a a bigger and bigger moat and then like two years later he came to us looking to sell his business and i was like okay this is interesting we knew that he uh, I, i looked at it because you know i knew that and there were a couple of things that he wasn't doing that if he knew that how to fix it like it would have doubled his business and put it back to where he was right so I, I knew that and I was like I, I kind of want to meet the guy so talked to him met him and then realized that he had like he had all the success and then he's like dude like something happened you guys came and, and you know I was just never able to recover and I found out that he outsourced his business he took the four-hour work week approach he hired some VAs he started traveling he was trying to find himself he went through a bad breakup he would go to personal development seminars like and he just took his foot off the gas and 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 honestly like learned a lot of lessons the hard way and that is like you it's very very difficult to just like hire like uh to just hire someone or a bunch of vas to just like completely run your business and expect them to do as good of a job as the person who got it there to begin with and i think that you know uh, uh, doing that doing that shift too quickly uh, can really set you back. And I think that was an important lesson for him to learn. Well, I do agree. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I do agree on what you were saying. It was, it's true that it's kind of to scale is another a skill level that maybe not all affiliate will have or SEO 
you know, people with that kind of skills. So I do agree with you on that part. Yeah. And yeah. And you know what, Travis, I think a lot of what you just said resonated a lot with myself as well as I imagine that the people that are out there listening, it resonates with them as, as well. And that is, we all have friends and family members that are like, yeah, well, I see your product. You're making all this money on Amazon, but where in the heck is the money? And they don't actually understand that to grow. And like you said, to scale, it takes a lot of investment not only in money, but as well as time. And that's if you're the one that's actually working in your business. And I've had a lot of friends and family that always ask me that, like, where's all the money? And they don't understand the simple business fact that you're reinvesting to grow for a future. So my question to you, Travis, killing it, is you've already mentioned a ton of different things that I would love to hear you talk about. But what three to five things are the things that you really truly want to talk to with the people out there that are going to participate in this first ever professor's pandemic? Hmm. I'd love to answer this to help. I guess for me, you know, I, I've been I've been there, done that with a lot of a lot of things, e-commerce, Amazon related. So, can you help me understand, like, the people that you think are listening to this? Where do you think, where if you were to imagine, like, their position, what they're trying to get, what do you think that person looks like, so that I can cater my response more to help them? I would imagine it's anywhere between a three to $10 million seller. And it's probably less than 10 million. I would imagine it's three to $5 million seller, mid-level Amazon seller, still probably even trying to wrap their head around picking the right products and ranking and reviews and things of that nature. So no, we're not really talking that high level. We're talking about somewhere in the middle stuck around three to five. Would you agree, Howie? I believe so. There, because uh, this is virtual, so I believe there's going to be some lower level sellers. But I think uh, this is right. It's about that. All right. So in that case, I have a pretty cool product development strategy that I really enjoy. I'll share kind of uh, a high level overview of, of what that looks like, and it completely eliminates a lot of reliance on tools, which I think is really important. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that. A second, I'm going to talk about a mindset, sh- a mindset shift that happened for me at least. So, you know, going from my seven to eight figure journey, I mean, you guys know this. Every time you, in any business, you reach a certain point and then you kind of like, you have to like make a shift in who you are to get to that next level, right? Like, like your thought process gets you here and then, you know, and then you get stuck and you have to like really like buckle down and like figure out, okay, like, what's holding me back and then you make a breakthrough and then all of a sudden you hit a new plateau and then you'll hit and you'll get stuck again you gotta make another breakthrough so there was a pretty cool breakthrough i had uh, in my seven to eight big journey that was basically like i guess another part of my background is i never came from any course i didn't take any like how to sell an amazon course or training and i think that made me quickly like go from you know seven to eight figures because i didn't really have like uh all these courses tend to tell you like okay, like we can help you get to like seven figures. They don't, there's not really courses that that, from my experience that show you how to go from like seven to eight. They're all designed to take a newbie to like seven figures and they kind of stop, right? And so I think that preconditions us to think that there's, that it's really difficult to get to eight, you know, to get to that eight figure mark. Uh, So we always are are like, well, we get in that sort of fixed course mindset, I think. And, uh, and I, I never had that. So I think that's a limiting belief. I think it's really important to make your own way. You know, think about like a problem from a simple, so from a simple answer to like, okay, now let's dive into the strategy. And I can discuss uh, that a little bit more with uh, just in general, when you think about like how to please Amazon. So I can, I can sort of talk about like that, what Amazon looks for product selection strategy and mindset shifts. Does that sound good? I think that sounds amazing. I, I know I'm excited for that. And for I'll, I'll be honest with you, every single time I talk to somebody new, I think, wow, that sounds so sexy. It sounds amazing. But this time I kind of really like, it's top the level of people that there are at this even higher and higher. And so Howie, how excited are you to hear all that information that Travis just talked about? I'm kind of interested on his non-reliant on tools approach for product research or product selection, because it's really important for the product to be a really, really good, I believe. First thing has to be the product. If it's a bad product, it's hard to ramp up in sales. And also a bad product, you can't, your reviews are too hard to maintain. So I believe, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah, you know, you've accomplished a lot, Travis, and obviously your nickname is pretty awesome, Travis Killing It. (laughs) 
But yeah. what is your end goal? Like, seriously, like you're already at the $50 million mark. And I know you're probably going to hit the $100 million mark very soon if you haven't already by the end of the year. But let's be honest, what is your overall end goal in Amazon? And where do you actually see Amazon for mid-level to higher level sellers that get really serious about this and take it to a whole new level like you have? Yeah. So my end goal, I mean, I just want to see what I'm capable of. I've already kind of reached beyond what I thought I could do. And it's like, I mean, I still don't even think I've given it. I, I don't even think I've given it my hundred percent. Like I work my ass off, but like, I know that there's still more left in the tank. And it's just like, when I, if, if I can look back at myself and know that I could have given more and what I, I don't want to look back and be like, oh, I could have given it more and gotten to another level. I don't want to, I don't want to look at myself as wasted talent or wasted potential. So if I can get to 100 million to 150 million or whatever, like that would be awesome. And I think that'd be a really cool test. And I think it's also cool to, uh, I've been exploring a lot more outside of Amazon to the retail game, the legitimate editorial press release, Shopify sales, like social media traffic, video marketing, getting a lot better at all that to really build like a fully developed business with a core competency in Amazon as a as a core marketplace so those th those those challenges are really interesting to me and i don't know i'm not really tired yet so <laughs> i'm not really looking to get out anytime soon okay so well remind me what's your next the amazon landscape right like what was my opinion of it and what, how right. i think it's changed i think that post covid is really good for amazon i think it's really good for e-commerce in general i think what it's proven and and or, i mean we we've seen it right like a lot of e-commerce is a hedge it's a head, it, like we always, <clears throat> we've always been unsure of where it stands and, and it's position of like, uh, of like, okay, what happens when the economy goes down? Okay. What happens when people start losing their jobs, right? Like how does that affect e-commerce? Does it follow the same trends as retail? And I think what we found through COVID is that like, it, it's honestly, it, it could even go up more, right? Because people are, are, are less impulse buyers and more like, okay, I need this. I'm getting this. I'm buying this, right? instead of going into a retail and, you know, being upsold a bunch of things, they're going with intent. I also think that a post COVID world, uh, people for a long time, even maybe even after, until, even after like vaccines are out, I think people are going to be more cautious in crowded environments when they, Oh wow. Okay. I'm going to go see my grandparents next week. Like, you know, like I, I I'm going to like chill. <clears throat> I'm going to super crowded places. I don't want to get them sick. So I'm just going to order more online. And I also think that when people get in the habit of ordering on Amazon, ordering online, and they have good experience and positive experiences, I think that that habit develops and continues. I think there was a lot of people that still resisted the idea of shopping online. And case in point, uh, Howard, I mean, Liz, you guys know this, like you see how sales dip on like Friday and Saturday, and then they start going back up. I think that the reason why that still happens is because people are still conditioned to think that deliveries don't happen on the weekend. Right, like that, that old school e-commerce mentality, where like if you don't order it on Monday and Tuesday, you're gonna get, it may not get there until next week. Yeah, I, I think that that, mentality, right. Travis. <laughs> right, but, but they're delivering seven days a week. Why do we have that? Right, it's like we have. Uh, there's a lot of people that are still like it takes it takes years to catch up to like the the up to date trends, and I think that it's forced people to learn that e-commerce can like be a part of their daily life. That it's really super convenient. That Oh, oh, you're out of something at the house? No need to write it down on the list. Just or By the time you write it down on the list, you could have just went ahead and ordered it. And I think that a lot of people, especially older generation that have been working from home or staying at home more and ordering online are now like having positive experiences and are going to continue that. Uh, case in point, like our sales haven't really dipped post COVID, post like, you know, measure, uh, I guess like quarantine not being as much of a thing, like restrictions being lifted and sales are still about the same. And so I think it, I think it was, a, I think it's really good for us. And I think it's really good for e-commerce. I think it legitimizes the business model even more. And I think that that's really good for everyone that's in the e-commerce game. Okay. So you just said some good stuff about the, the pandemic and everything for Amazon or online e-commerce. What kind of problems do you see Amazon sellers right now in 2020 during the pandemic that you see? For sure, like you got, like from a supply chain point of view, things are taking longer, and I don't know how long that's going to take, right? And I also think there's a lot of geopolitical uncertainty. With uh, who knows, like what the relationship with China is going to be like after all this is done. Hopefully, 
it goes back to the way things were, but it could not, right? There's a lot of, still a lot of uncertainty around like what that future looks like. If there's another wave of COVID, like what does that, how does that, how does that disrupt supply chain again? Things are, shipments are taking longer. And I think that uh, shipping perhaps could go up in price and be more expensive because uh, since, you know, planes travel industry, right? Like since uh, that's plummeted and probably won't recover for a very long time, it means that airlines are going to start going under and it means that there's going to be like that, that cost to like ship things could potentially go up. And I think that those are, those are some uncertainties out there that, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta learn to deal with. And I think it, it I think the scare from it all is like, okay, we need to, a, a couple of takeaways that we got from it personally is that, okay, we need to make sure we're diversified fulfillment wise. So remember when Amazon was like, taking three or four weeks to fulfill orders. Well, we had to quickly diversify and like learn how to do like 3PL, like accelerate that process faster. From a supply chain point of view, like we realized that a lot of, our, we needed to have redundancy in, in our supply chain. And we also need, uh, for us, post COVID, I think it's more critical than ever to have more months of inventory um, available. One of our huge competitive advantages is that in niches where we, we would perhaps show the number two or number three, we just waited it out and the top guys would run out of inventory and we were just right there uh, positioned to take it. We, we, we overstocked a little bit by luck. We had just like ordered a bunch to re- and revised a bunch of sales estimates and out of all of our products in the U.S., we only had one that ran out of stock with sales jumping 60-70% and not being able to get new, new orders in through all of this. I think that from logistically, like there's a lot of uh, change. There's a lot of... Uh, um, of adapt- adaptations you did make. So I, I do believe like for, for, for a seller to be like mastered into that country or that, that particular uh, niche or for each country, if you're selling worldwide, you should have, and to, uh, to an extent, have a warehouse in each country that you're selling in. Because like example, like what you were saying, you're, oh, I'm doing Shopify now. I'm, I'm, I'm doing B2B maybe or you're looking into B2B, that's where you need a, like a fulfillment center or, or a warehouse that you control. So, uh, cause I, I'm uh, kind of old school. I started like 2003 e-commerce. So I kind of like had my own warehouse. I had to had warehouse and then I had to do my own customer service and then I had to do marketing and also uh, purchasing. So, so we were, we had to do more things than before than, than now for those people that are involved in FBA. But I, I think like you said, have a, have a well-rounded solution where you're like a redundancy. That's right. So okay. where he was actually getting to Travis is that there's obviously a lot of opportunities out there, especially right now, the landscape we see. Okay, cool. So I was saying, I was saying that I think opportunities on Amazon are going to, that I've noticed, you know, a lot of the game is the same, at least for me, but I do think video is becoming more important. I think that organic video placements are being tested. And I think that sponsored video placements are being tested. And I think that that, and I think videos is something that are something that, uh, that, I mean, it, unlike like enhancement, well, I also think enhanced brand content is a big, is like a, something that everyone says they do, but maybe like 5% do actually like do it really well. Like I was at the beginning when enhanced brand content came out, I, I knew like, I even tested it on our own listings. I was, a lot of people were like, oh, just get it out there. But actually did you test your conversion rate before and after, right? Like, so some of our listings actually converted better without the enhanced brand content than with it. And we had to keep doing revisions over and over and over again to finally like find an enhanced brand content that actually like worked better than the listing with no enhanced brand content. And I don't think people were testing that. I think people were just slapping it up there subjectively thinking that it looked good and assuming that, you know, because it's a feature Amazon allows you to use that it's, that you should use it. I think that the same thing with videos. I think that a lot of people are rushing videos. I see a lot of competitors with videos on their listing, but they're shitty. And I think that honestly, it's hurting their conversion rates. I think that for people that spend the time to do it correctly, to hire like legitimate video companies that spend the time to like, you know, work, don't, don't just hands off the approach, like actually have like a team member that understands the brand and the brand val- and the brand proposition and what, how we want to, and has a unique attention to detail and professionalism are going to stand out even more given when given the opportunity to showcase reviews even more, I mean, uh, videos even more. So I think those are some, some opportunities going forward. Yeah, those and, are some great tips, actually. You know, one, one thing came to mind 
I know that you've been working on a lot of other sites off of Amazon. Which one of the actual projects that you have brewing up right now off of Amazon is the most exciting and why? Like for me, I can say that I've actually been doing some Walmart and I know how he knows this and I've got my first Walmart store up and running. And so I'm excited about the prospect of selling more on Walmart. But for you, Travis, just being an innovator and like I said, what's going to help take you to the hundred million dollar point? What other marketplaces are you working on and which one's your favorite? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, Shopify is my favorite because of multiple reasons. One, like obviously you control the customer better and two, it gives me a lot more presence from Google, right? Search engine. So I'm getting like a, a lot more organic traffic from, from fr organic is like the, you know, the ROAS on organic is zero. <laughs> so the, any customer I don't have to pay for, I want to maximize that. And Google just launched uh, free shopping ads. So uh, now like a, a lot of my listings are appearing organically in Google shopping without having to pay for them. And I also uh, pay for them as well, but getting, I'm getting like, I don't know, like 10% of shopping ad, uh, shopping sales from Google shopping now are, are free. And it, was, and it was zero a couple months ago. So that's just like, that's just like icing on the cake. I also use Shopify to manage all of my marketplaces. So like Walmart can be managed through Shopify. So like I have one place to fix pricing and then it syncs up with the marketplaces, right? So if I want to do FBM offers, have them run through Shopify. So I'm using that to like manage, to manage price synchronization, listing optimizations and create bundles, all sorts of cool shit, and do the fulfillment as well. Shopify is building their own fulfillment network, which is it's just going to be sick. They're building it from the ground up with robotics. So like, it's going to be like really, really good and cost, and cost competitive. And also, I think Shopify is going to launch their own marketplace called Shopify Marketplace, or Shop, something marketplace with Shopify, and all Shopify sellers are automatically going to be a part of it. And I think that that's a huge channel opportunity that can actually compete with Amazon. Uh, they've already got like that unique checkout experience across all stores. Uh, that's the biggest reason why a lot of people shop on Amazon is their information is saved and it's a quick checkout. Well, Shopify is already working on that. So I think that's a really big opportunity. And Walmart, of course, I know uh, I've had friends now and I have one of my brands uh, has been approached by Walmart retail just strictly because of their success in the category on Walmart. I think the future of getting into Walmart retail is going to require you to be on walmart.com first and demonstrate success on walmart.com and then getting reviews in order to even get a shot at going into retail. Uh, and that's the, the trend that I've noticed them taking this year in 2020. And that's from like people that I know personally that have gotten into Walmart retail and uh, it's all because of how their walmart.com sales were. So I think that's a that's like the best channel online channel to be a part of. Those two, I would just focus on Shopify and Walmart. I wouldn't, I mean, the other ones, I'm sure they're going to add some value here and there, but it would not be a top priority of mine. Uh, that sounds good. So let's wrap it up. What kind of final words do you have for, our, you want to leave to our, for our audience here? Yeah. So, hmm. you know, I really think it's important to treat, you know, your business Imagine yourself being a kid again. You remember when you were 11, you could tell yourself, you know, 10, 11, even nine, like you were, you just knew like, oh, if something cool is happening or someone was doing something cool, like you were just like, oh, I, I want to do that. And you just, it, there was no hesitation. There was no limiting belief that you just did it. And I always knew like, you know, if someone else is having a lot of success on Amazon, well, why can't I, right? Like, I don't, I, I don't think I'm any less capable. I think I just, they just like figured something out and I think I can figure it out too. And I think it's important to come at, come at the, to figure your own way on Amazon, right? Like don't simply rely on tools, figure out what, how the tools even work. A lot of people don't understand how the tools uh, even work or develop the strategies that the tools have. And try to like, not like follow what everyone else is doing. So like rebates are a great example. If everyone's getting, you know, rebate customers from mini chat and Facebook, well, it worked really great like 12 months ago when I started doing it. And then now it's like, okay, well, reviews are getting are not sticking. Okay. You know, it, it's a little riskier now. The weight isn't the same anymore for the purchases, for rankings, the buyer profiles tend to be abused, the Facebook. And it all turns down to the fact that Facebook's algorithm is just going to give you what has worked well with customers that have interacted with similar ads as yours, which means they're going to display your ads to similar people 
regardless of your targeting options that have engaged with those types of ads, right? And so those same people are getting, are buying tons and tons and tons of products they're getting reimbursed for and leaving reviews. What's going to happen? I mean, Howard, you know this better than me, but like the internal buyer score algorithm says that as a buyer's trust goes down, the impact of the actions that they take go down and the likelihood of the, and, and the risk profile that they pose on your listing goes up. So like, what, don't do what everyone else is doing. Where else can you get customers to do that that haven't been abused, right? So it's not that the strategy in itself is necessarily flawed, but perhaps the execution and reliance on the same way that everyone else is doing it is <laughs> that it has been abused. So can you do something different? Just think about that with everything, right? It's like product selection. Can you think of a different way to analyze products that the tools are using? When it comes to like ranking, okay, like, what is the simple solution that Amazon's trying to solve? Are they trying to find, are they trying to have search results that maximize the amount of money that Amazon makes? So would that entail high conversion rates, you know, middle mid market pricing Would that entail making sure that your listings are converting well for keywords all the way through the purchase Would that entail like, you know, historical data or like trends with your listing Would that entail, you know, attributes like reviews or uh, certain listing elements, time on page, things like that, right? Like now you can start thinking, uh, if I want to maximize that simple goal, then what would I look at if I were Amazon? And I just think like just having the simple way to look at creating a simple answer first and then dialing down a strategy has always worked for me. And I think that's a really good strategy to take with all things Amazon related. And yeah, I think that would be a good takeaway. Awesome. Anything for you, Howie, that you'd like to add there based off of what Travis just said? Oh, you said it perfectly. It's crazy. Uh -huh. uh, he, he's, uh, I, I like how he is. He thinks like high level, you know, that's where we like all our mastermind members to be at. Yeah, absolutely. I enjoyed a lot what you said, Travis. I felt that it was super helpful to me. Like I could take some of the things that you actually just said right now and implement them and probably have a great deal of success with them if I keep testing and keep doing them. You basically gave me a whole bunch of crap to add to my to-do list. So thank you so much, Travis, killing it. I really enjoyed you on this actual. Yeah. Let me add, add one more thing. So like I've been telling everyone, like, you know, like these Facebook and Facebook mini chat stuff, if everyone is using it, then how, then you're just like everyone else, you know, you're not special mm -hmm. at all. So that's why on our stuff that we do, we try to, throw different kind of signals, you know, instead of just one signal at all. So that's where Amazon itself is, is looking at, looking at how everyone else is getting their traffic. And then when there's something different or they, their AI will learn it and they'll also uh, like reward you uh, with the uh, different kind of channels or signals that you give it, it's just not just rebate or through mini chat and Facebook. Yeah. You always want to emulate natural behavior, right? Like, you don't want to start creating an association between your listing and what like uh, shady tellers are doing. You don't really want to follow those trends. I also like, you know, going back to my like anti-course mentality, like there's when someone, how you phrase something is really important. So like when I ask for help from my team, instead of telling them like, Hey, like, you know, mini chats not really working. Facebook's not really working. You know, they immediately like start thinking about, okay, well, maybe there's something that we need to change in our script. Maybe we need to change a certain link. Maybe we need to like change the frequency of how many rebates we're doing per day. Like they, 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 they don't like look back and ask, can we, can we execute the same strategy differently? So when I phrase the question asking for input from other people, I immediately just say, look, we're trying to accomplish this. We're trying to get people to buy a product that not every other seller is getting, right? And we want them to follow certain actions and incentivize them, but we wanna stay within Amazon's TOS. This is how we've been doing it. I'm worried that the way that we've been doing it is being abused. So is there another way that you could think of that may work? And immediately by phrasing it that way, like <laughs> I had team members telling me, okay, let's fucking hire some people to go to malls. And just like, just like literally go and like get people in the mall to do it. And I'm just like, okay, like that's a good idea. You're thinking the right thing. So like, how can we scale this a little bit better and perhaps not have brand ambassadors in malls? But, you know, so, but I, I started really getting a lot of really good input that way. And I think it's important, you know, to, uh, as Howard was saying, like 
you know, look at the end goal and then work your way back and don't never assume that the way that thing that the industry says is how you're supposed to do something is actually how you're supposed to do it. All right. Absolutely. Amazing. Another amazing bit there. And I know I'm excited to hear what his speech is going to be at again, the end of the month, June 29th and 30th, the first ever professor's pandemic event live from your actual living room. You can be in your pajamas. You can be whatever it is that you want to be. It doesn't really matter because we're not going to see the bottom half of you. However, you will get to hear the best strategies, the best tactics, and the best overall business systems that the underground people in all of Amazon have built and created $50 million empires. You heard Travis here. Travis killing it is going to hit $100 million soon. So you get to listen into what is going on inside of his genius mind. And I know, again, I cannot say this enough, but I am super excited for this. To get more information, go to a9mastermind.com forward slash PPE. You can learn all about the event again, June 29th and 30th. And before we leave here and say goodbye, Howie, any last words from you? I mean, I, 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 I hate to say this, but I'm not, uh, I don't really speak too much on words, but uh, I'm totally excited to see what all our speakers are trying to, are going to talk about. And uh, hopefully we'll bring more and more of a community that we're building a community and have everyone there and be excited to teach more of the next generation sellers. And no worries, Howie, you bring the tactics, you bring the strategies. I've got enough mouth for the both of us. And so uh, with that being said, I will say goodbye to everyone here. I hope to see you again live virtually in the comfort of your own home, the first ever Professor's Pandemic event, June 29th and 30th. To get more information, go to a9mastermind.com forward slash PPE, and I will see you all there. So peace out. All right, see you guys. Thanks, guys.